Continuing the Gospel Project today, and in the adult curriculum, we're in Unit 2, Session 2, which uh, is titled Sin Spreads. In the children's program, we're at the Tower of Babel. Uh, both are talking about the same period of, of biblical history, by and large, just the different ends of it. Uh, what we're looking at is the escalation of sin in the world, that what begins with the sin in the garden escalates. So today in the adult curriculum, we've got uh, the story of Cain and Abel, the story of Lamech, and the escalation of sin and death in the world. Uh, that in the, the story of Genesis is going to culminate in the story of the flood, which was covered last week in the children's curriculum. And then this week in the children's curriculum, you'll be at the Tower of Babel, where, again, you have this kind of collapse of human civilization again, where it goes astray. Um, and, and just the overall theme in the narrative is the spread and influence of sin and how it's undermined human civilization and human life. Um, so today's big question then, both in the children's class and, and adult classes, is how does sin uh, start with one couple, Adam and Eve, but then end with all of us? Because that's, that's what it's trying to explain still. If you think of this as the big kind of meta question, why is the world the way it is? Especially if God is good and he created a good creation, why is it that it seems like so many bad things are going on in the world? And the Genesis answer is us. Uh, we were corrupted. Yeah, we were tempted. Yes, we were deceived. And someone else is to blame for that part of it. But then we participated in this problem from that time forward and actually spread it amongst ourselves. So point one in this morning's curriculum is transgression spread throughout the generations. Um, Genesis 4 verses 1 through 2 begins, Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. So what's fascinating about this part of the, the text is that it's not really what we would have expected at the end of the last story. At the end of the last story, you remember we were told that the result of eating of the tree of good and evil would be death. Same day you eat of it, you will surely die. And yet, a lightning bolt doesn't come from heaven and smite them. What shape would that death take? 
Or is it possible that um, even though God had promised death would follow the sin in the garden, maybe it doesn't. Maybe maybe they escaped it somehow. Uh, well, this this story picks up there. They've been pushed out of the garden, which is its own kind of death. But then the chapter starts with a birth announcement. Not only are they not dying, they're having children. And so again, you might be tempted to believe, oh, well, okay, we've escaped death. Uh, but it turns out death in this story is going to be a more subtle enemy. So verses 3 through 5, In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. Uh, the text doesn't actually tell you a lot about what's going on here. A lot of sermons have been preached, a lot of lousy sermons have been preached, trying to make sense of the details of this, and the story just doesn't give it to you. It, it doesn't tell you what set of rules had God given Cain and Abel regarding their, their sacrifices, if any, uh, what was the, the purpose of these sacrifices? Were they offering of thanks? Were they trying to atone for sin? Uh, what, what's, what's the function of it? Uh, why is it that the text says God had regard for Abel? Why does he regard Abel? And what does that even mean? In Hebrew, the expression had regard uh, means literally God, God looked at it. So think of it as like there's two two plates of food. Uh, you're at a restaurant and they give you two different, uh, two different desserts. They say, would you like A or B? And, and you look and your face is turned towards the cheesecake because that's the one you want. Um, that's kind of the term used. Like the, you look and you just prefer one. Um, what does that mean? What does it mean to say God preferred or had regard for Abel and his offering, that he turned his face toward it to look at it? as opposed uh, to Abel rather than to Cain, um, doesn't really explain it uh, at all. Um, I don't think we're supposed to know all the details of it, or it would have given it to us. Uh, sometimes the preacher will say, well, because you have to have an animal sacrifice to please God. Uh, you have to have blood to atone. But that's assuming this is a sacrifice for sin, which it doesn't say that it is per se. Uh, in fact, if you read Leviticus chapter 2, um, grain offerings. So remember, what does Cain do? Cain gives of the fruit of the ground, uh, the crops. Grain offerings were not inherently fat, bad. In fact, they're commanded at times. If you read Leviticus 2, it's just a lengthy discussion of how to give a grain offering and how to you know, turn it into bread and then offer that before God as a way of thanksgiving for your crops. And so at times, that was completely acceptable, depending on the circumstance and the occasion, even under the law of Moses, which, of course, doesn't exist yet. So even if Leviticus said never offer grain, that wouldn't necessarily help Cain and Abel because they don't have Leviticus. But again, my point is, that it just it's not obvious to me why one is better. And I don't think we should assume that there's something inherently right about the animal sacrifice and inherently wrong about the, the grain sacrifice. The point is that they were different, and Cain himself is trying to understand, well, why, why wasn't mine good enough? What, what's going on here? The New Testament actually has more to say about that than the Old Testament. The Old Testament doesn't have much at all. Um, Jesus will, in Matthew 23, 35, refer to Abel as righteous Abel. Refers to him as the, the first martyr, in a sense. Righteous Abel's blood speaks to us. Um, and we wonder, you know, okay, well, what was particularly righteous about Abel? doesn't say much, just that he was the better one. Um, Hebrews eleven four has more detail. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. So faith contributed to Abel's sacrifice being more acceptable. And if you'll stick with the story a little bit, you get an insight into Cain as it develops that Cain doesn't have faith. He doesn't trust God. He doesn't believe God is just. He doesn't believe God is fair. 
Uh, he doesn't believe God can actually provide for him and protect him. We'll get to that in a few verses. And so it's entirely possible that the only difference between Cain's sacrifice and Abel's sacrifice was the faith of the man making the sacrifice. And it could be that's the whole thing. And that's what made it more acceptable was his faith. 1 John 3, 11 and 12 says, For this is the message you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. Why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Uh, this text just says Cain wasn't as good a person as Abel. Whereas you know, Hebrews says that in terms of faith, here it's in terms of brotherly love. He just wasn't as good a human being. And so maybe there was something disingenuous about Cain's sacrifice, that he offered it uh, grudgingly or without a pure heart, whereas Abel was genuine and authentic. Maybe that's the difference. Um, and then one more thought that comes to mind comes from 2 Corinthians 8, 12. No Cain or Abel reference here, but Paul is instructing the church of Corinth about their contributions, their financial giving. And he says, if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. Which leads me to believe if Cain had been offering the sacrifice to God with the right heart and demeanor that's expected of him, the fact that it was grain as opposed to lamb or something wouldn't have made any difference. That what God is looking for is within a person not just the particular item. So I, I don't buy the idea that Cain just didn't read the rule book right and offered the wrong sacrifice. I think there's something wrong with Cain's heart and his genuineness towards God, something that Abel has that he lacks, which then re is reinforced by the fact that God appreciates the genuineness of Abel, and then Cain gets mad about it, uh, just reinforcing the kind of guy he is. But I think the lesson we take away is the consistent biblical interpretation is that God judges the heart of the giver more than the quality of the gift. That it's not about the amount, it's not about even the quality. I mean, the Bible has a lot to say about the quality of sacrifices, but above all that, it talks about the penitent heart of the person making the sacrifice. That if you come to God with the right attitude and demeanor, um, that is more important than some particular detail of what you did. And I think that's probably something good to remember here with Cain and Abel. Something was wrong between the two of them that goes deeper than what happens to happen in their sacrifice. Well, God notices, of course, that Cain is upset about this. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Um, why are you mad, Cain? <laughs> this, this problem is of your own doing. I mean, there's nothing, no one's being mean to you, Cain. You ever get this where something bad happens and the person decides they're being picked on instead of taking responsibility for their own actions? Cain, you've made these choices. You haven't developed morally in the way that Abel has, and there's something different between you two. So do better. That, that's the answer, right? If your sacrifice isn't accepted, if there's something wrong with your worship, do better. Uh, come to God with a purer heart. Come to God with more sincerity and more penitence. Um, take a look at your life and be introspective for a moment. Don't blame the person next to you who happens to be doing something that pleases God. Um, God says if you do well, it's good. <laughs> if you do well, it'll be accepted. That's good news. Uh, if you continue down this road you're going, sin is crouching at the door. This is the first use of the word sin in the Bible. And it's fascinating that sin is described as crouching at the door like a monster, like it's its own entity. Um, the Bible describes sin in a variety of ways, but one of them is this monster within. There's a great line in the Gospel Project workbook it says, the danger wasn't outside of Cain, the enemy was within. And that's the picture here of sin described as a monster with a will of its own, that it gets within us and, and starts to change us from within. 
and and we're complicit in that. We let it in. It's not like I'm not suggesting you say sin made me do it or the devil made me do it. That's actually something that gets you in trouble too, passing blame and and ignoring your own moral responsibility. But it there is this feeling, this sensation when you are tempted and when you sin that it starts to take on its own life. It starts to have control of you. And there's a moment in there where you had some choices to make. That's what God says, right? You can do well and we can get better with this. Or there's this monster that's going to take control of you and you don't know what's going to happen next if it's in control. Uh, this is very similar in my mind to the way Paul describes his conscience and moral life in Romans 7, 13 through 17. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For I did not understand my own actions, for I did not do what I want, or I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. So it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Now is Paul trying to say I'm not responsible for my sins? No, he's describing what it feels like to be a sinner. And he says that at some point it feels like I know better, that I want to do good and I'm not, as if sin has taken on a life of its own. And that's exactly how God describes sin to Cain, that you're about to let something into your life that's going to take over. It's the monster crouching at the door and it's going to take you a lot further than you want to go. And of course, that's what happens next in the story. Verse eight says, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And here we have the first uh, act of murder and violence in Scripture. Um, the text does describe the, the scene that follows in God's interaction with Abel, or excuse me, with Cain. Um, we won't spend a lot of time here, but just notice how similar the story is to um, God in the garden with Adam and Eve. In the garden with Adam and Eve in chapter 3, uh, they sin they hide. God asks them a question. Who who told you? Where are you and who told you you're naked? Um, Adam tries to blame Eve. Eve tries to blame the serpent. And then God says, nah, it's not going to work out. Here are the consequences of that. Okay, now listen to this story. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. So it's actually the same pattern. God inquires about their sin. Man attempts to avoid blame and pass the responsibility down the road. And then God declares the long-term consequence of sin. So what's, what's happening in the story? Transgression is spreading what began with Adam and Eve is now repeating itself in the life of Cain. That's, that's the big point. What happened in Adam and Eve is repeating itself in the life of Cain. And then that's going to spread out into all of human society. Bonus lesson here. This is a little section of the story I find interesting. It's not covered in the Gospel Project notes, but I want to talk about it. Um, the idea of fear and security and the origins of cities and human civilization um, is of interest to me. God says there's going to be a consequence, long-term consequence for your sin. Cain makes this remark back to God. My punishment is greater than I can bear. What's going on there? Cain is not convinced of God's justice. I did something wrong, and now you've punished me. I don't think what you've done is fair. I don't think the punishment fits the crime. It's more than I can handle. Uh, God, uh, Cain does not get, trust God's restraint or God's protection. I think you've gone too far, and I think you've abandoned me. I think that I'm a goner now. This is a death sentence. Okay, Which, in a sense, it is a death sentence, but it's not abandonment. Cain does not appreciate the gravity of his own sin. Think about this now. He's murdered his brother, and then he complains to God, well, I, I'm not going to survive this. Well, that would be fair. If God just put Cain to death immediately, it would be fair, life for life. 
you murder someone, you die. That's fair. Cain seems to think he deserves better and that God hasn't been fair. And so just look at Cain's rationale with that again. And we see it so often. We do something wrong and then we start to blame God if you're picking on me. And that's not the issue. We doubt that God still cares for us. Like if you punish me, you must not love me anymore. And in the next verse, God says, that's not at all the case. Behold, you have driven, me, uh, this is Cain again. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. Again, Cain thinks he's doomed. And he specifically describes his motivation as one of fear. From your face I shall be hidden. He doesn't trust God, doesn't expect God cares for him anymore. I'm going to get away from you. I'm going to hide and take care of myself. Cain does not trust God, and instead he intends to secure his own safety. I'm going to go hide, because otherwise people are going to kill me. You won't take care of me. Again, God says, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. We hear some of it, the mark of Cain. Uh, the mark of Cain was an act of grace that it's God's way of saying, despite Cain's sin and faithful faithlessness, God is providing grace and care. Cain, I still love you. God doesn't send Cain away. Cain leaves the presence of God. Cain says, I'm going to die out here. God says, no, I'm, I'm going to protect you. So even though he's murdered his brother, and even though there are consequences... God still loves and protects Cain, but Cain doesn't believe that. Cain believes only in his own shame and his own fear, and that fear motivates him and his family for what follows. So verse 17, Cain knew his wife. She conceived and bore son Enoch. And when he, he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of son Enoch. Don't, don't forget the preceding context. The development of the human city and of the civilization that comes from it is a direct result of distrust of God and the pursuit of our own security. Why, why does Cain establish a little house with a wall around it? That's what a city is, right? You put some houses down, you put a wall around it, and you've got your city. Why? He doesn't believe God is going to protect him. He thinks uh, they're going to get me. And he lives in this paranoia the rest of his life, thinking... Uh, I've got to protect myself from the world because if I don't take care of myself, God's not going to do it. People are out to get me. And the very next verse then is, and so I you know, built a city. I've got a wall. I've got my own little structure and infrastructure because God's not taking care of me. I'm not dependent on God anymore. I'm going to be independent and take care of myself. Um, and in the text that follows, that is kind of the, the link in the chain of how do you get from Adam and Eve, Cain, and then to the rest of human civilization is that it's this running from God and running to our own uh, protection and our own security, independence rather than dependence, that leads us into sin. So part two, wickedness, then begins to spread throughout the generations. Uh, verses 18 to 22, Enoch, who is the son of Cain, was uh, born, to him was born Irad, Irad fathered Machiljael, and Machiljael uh, fathered Methushael, and Methusiel fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of one was Ada, and the name of one was Zilha. And Ada bore Jabal. Uh, skip a bit here. His brother's name was Jubal. Zilha uh, also bore Tubal Cain. The sister of Tubal Cain was Naamah. Uh, this bit is strange to us. I mean, if we're reading this, we think, why, why, why do I need a list of strange names? But uh, as a side note, not even a side note, like as a primary note, <laughs> the rest of the structure of the narrative flow of the Bible is lar largely built around generational accounts. That this is the story of our families. This is the story of where we come from. That's how the, how the story is told. Ancient storytellers are much more interested in that than we are. Modern novels tend to just pick one character and say this is what happened in this guy's life. Ancient stories were about father, son, mother, daughter, and the passage and lineage of, of things happening down generationally. And the Bible definitely is constructed in that way. And so you get to expect a long, long list of names because they were interesting to, to ancient people to see heritage passed down. 
And it should be interesting to us, because again, our question is, how does evil get in the world? Heritage. Uh, we, we came by it honest. Um, it describes the development of human civilization again. Uh, Cain and Enoch developed the city. And then in those cities, verses 18 to 22, Jabal is the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. Jubal, the father of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. Tubal Cain, the forger of all instruments of brawn and iron. So domestication, uh, the arts and the things we associate with high culture, and then technology or instrumentation um, might be even warfare. I'm not sure what it means when it says he was the forger of instruments of bronze and iron. In the ancient world, uh, they weren't building factories. What were they making out of bronze and iron? Armor and weapons. Okay, so domestication, the arts, warfare, uh, that last bit especially is important. Uh, this is how civilization is developing. God's abandoned us. Abandoned us. We got to figure on our own. We're not going to live um, as the custodians of God's world so much as we're going to have to take control of God's world. We've got to be more forcible with it. And, and technology and all that comes as a development of that. I'm not saying technology is bad. I'm just saying that often the motivation behind our developments in human history is tied to we don't think God's going to take care of it, and so we'll, we'll fix that. And it's just an interesting feature of the text to me. Lamech's an interesting character. We don't tell the story of Lamech nearly enough. I actually think it's a very important Bible story. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voices. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. Okay. So God had promised... Uh, Cain, I'm going to take care of you. Cain doesn't believe it. God says, well, okay, Cain, if anybody hurts you, I'll, I'll take care of that. I'll, I'll take care of the justice and retribution. Lamech says, I can do better than that. Somebody hurt me, I killed him. In fact, my new rule is this. You kill me, I'm going to hit you back 77-fold. Right? It's, it's not, it's not uh, a proportional response. It's not eye for an eye. It's eye for an 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 eye, right? We're, we're going to really pile on the vengeance, and that's going to protect me. If, if you know that if you hurt me, I'm going to wipe out your family, well, you're not going to hurt me. I'm going to rule through fear, and violence becomes the tool for my own protection, Islamic's philosophy. Um, this is an escalation of violence, right? Whereas um, God promised justice and protection. Lamech says, no, I'll get it for myself. A special note uh, is the wording here when Lamech intends to improve on God's justice. In the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament called the Septuagint, abbreviated LXX, the 77-fold is translated into Greek uh, 70 times 7. Uh, to my knowledge, there are only two places in the Greek Bible where 70 times 7 is used. One is with Lamech saying, I will pour out vengeance 70 times 7 times. The other is with Jesus. Okay, uh, You may remember this in Matthew 18. Peter says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as 7 times. All right, very similar. Lamech said, hey, somebody wronged me. I'm not just going to get him back seven times. That's, that was Cain's system. I'm not doing that. I'm going to do it 70 times seven or 77 fold. Um, Jesus says, don't just forgive seven times, forgive 77 times or 77 fold or seven times. Say. It's, it's, it, the numbers are hard to figure out exactly what the number is. So don't try to do the math. But the, the text is the same. The, the wording is the same, that it's, as many times as Lamech wanted to give vengeance and violence, Jesus says that's how many times we're going to forgive. Jesus' solution is to make a, an escalation of mercy. Whereas Lamech just made the world more violent and terrible, Jesus says we need a multiplication of forgiveness. Forgiveness, unlike vengeance, is placing trust in God's justice. Vengeance is where you say, I don't think God's going to make this right. I'm going to get what's mine. Forgiveness where you say, if there's something that needs sorted, God will sort it. I don't have to. And that's what Jesus teaches. 
we follow the other path and violence escalates in the world. And because violence spreads in the world, death spreads throughout the generations, which is our third point. Genesis 5, 3 through 4. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness, after his image, and named him Seth. The days of Adam, after he fathered Seth, were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. That language there of after his own likeness and his own image is, is probably telling Seth and all the descendants of Adam continue the sad legacy of Adam. I don't just I don't think that just means and they were human. I mean that's obvious. Uh, Adam didn't give birth to a cat, but Adam and Eve gave birth to a son, and that son is going to be more like Adam and less like God. More in the image of Adam, less in the image of God, and that means being a sinner. Um, the consequence of that is death. That was our original question. Did we escape death? Did we, did we cheat the system? God said we'd die. Yeah, we died. It, it catches up, right? All the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. And if you read this next section, that's the repeated point. It's repeated seven times. Seven is one of these important Old Testament numbers. Seven times in the next several verses. Thus all the days of Seth, 912 years, and he died. Enosh, and he died. Kenan, and he died. Mahalalel, and he died. Jared, and he died. Methuselah, and he died. Lamech, and he died. They live a long time, and then they die. Okay. Adam and Eve did not escape death. They had brought death into the world the day that they sinned. Uh, as God told Cain, sin was lurking at the door, and it wants to have control. And once it gets into the world, it infests the world. And with sin comes death. So the world that follows is one plagued by violence, and death comes with that. Paul describes it this way in Romans 5, 12 through 14. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one who was to come. Where does sin make its way into the world? When we imitate Father Adam rather than imitating God, what we really need is somebody who can accept the consequence of what Adam has done, reverse the verdict, and show us how to be remade in the image of God. We need a new Adam. And of course, the New Testament tells us that's the story we're headed towards in Jesus Christ.